for the front row and then bring more on deck and try to do it quickly. Jerry okay. or Oops. Sorry, did I miss you? Yeah. There was one group of three. Yeah. Oh, okay. Is there a good one? Oh, come on. Sorry. Our next one is how I know it's more time. Good evening, my name is Susie McClellan and I teach fifth grade in Boston Public Schools. I've been working in Boston Public Schools since 1999. I was also a committee member with the MCAS Assessment Development Committee, the ABC with the Massachusetts DESE from January 2008 to December 2012. And as a member of that committee, um, which was made up of 10 other or 10 or so other teachers, it was my job to review possible eighth grade ELA MCAS items for alignment to the Massachusetts curriculum framework and the MCAS performance standards. We reviewed test items, also known as questions, for the developmental appropriateness, instructional worthiness, and content accuracy. And after field testing, the committee would review the questions with field performance data. Um, we also assisted in the selection of reading passages for the idea that the ELA test items would be based on. So during this time, I learned a lot about standardized tests, and I'm not, I was not scared of standardized tests. Um, but I'll go on to how that's changed a little bit in a bit, but I just wanted, one thing I noticed was um, we gave a practice park in my school and we used a park sample test for the fifth grade, it was a big test, and that's a wonderful story about, you know, Boston's resident poet, Phil Sweetly, and as I scanned the sample test, I noticed that there were at least six words on the passage that were above fifth grade level, a couple of them were sixth grade level, and a couple were ninth and eleventh grade level words. And this makes me question the creation of the part test and how the passages are selected for creating the impasse. We carefully reviewed every single word to ensure that they were at the appropriate grade level so that the eighth grader could read them independently. This part passage had no footnotes or other ways for the students to access them as they were not understandable through context clues. Additionally, there are poorly worded questions on the part that makes me really question how valid these tests are. This doesn't mean I'm, I'm still advocating for MCAS, though. Indeed, instead, um, I do feel like we need to really get rid of all of these high-stakes tests because they're really taking over the culture of my school. And they're taking away from us the political culture that should be in the classroom. And I think we're also having a conversation about something when maybe the conversation needs to shift to something else. I want to recommend that everyone on the board get this book and please read it. It's called This Is Not a Test, A New Narrative on Race, Class, and Education by Jose Luis Wilson. He's an eighth grade teacher in New York City and he writes very eloquently on testing and race and class and education. He's not afraid to test either, but he's seen how these policies are blocking our understanding and blocking our attention to what we really need to focus on in education in this country. So in conclusion, my students have taken hundreds of hours of practice tests since second grade, and they're only in fifth grade. So I really want to ask that we have less testing, more learning, because we can do better for our students, and we need to do better for them. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Kathy Greeley, and I am an educator from Cambridge. I've also worked in the Boston schools. Um, I started teaching in 1980, and I have seen a transformation of what happens in schools in that time, um, and which disturbs me greatly. Um, I come with a number of colleagues from Cambridge, and we have brought you um, two petitions, one that we just started circulating um, just a little bit less than a week ago, um, asking you to vote no against the park, and we have, at the last count, we had 290 signatures, um, and we have over 400 signatures from parents on a supporting petition. In addition, Members of the Cambridge City Council and the Cambridge School Committee have proposed motions echoing our concerns as educators. Um, I come here to say that being
being opposed to the park does not mean that you are opposed to rigor or critical thinking. In fact, I think it's because I so value the idea of critical thinking, um, pushing their mind, helping children really grow. One of the best things as an educator is to see children achieve things that they never thought possible, but through the support and encouragement and pushing, sometimes really hard pushing by teachers, you see them do amazing things, and that gives them the confidence to grow and move on. I wanted my students to read, write, discuss, debate, reflect on complex texts. I worked for a long time as a middle school teacher. I'm now a literacy coach for a K-5 school. And we, we, that is our, our purpose, is to push our students to do that. However, I really don't believe that a standardized test written by the Pearson Company is going to do this for us. In fact, I believe that having a standardized test to measure critical thinking is a contradiction in terms. I would like to just share, a, a few days ago, the literacy coaches in um, my district had a meeting and we were looking at some of the parts of the sample assessments. And I'm just going to read the first question which stopped us for about 20 minutes on the fifth grade test for ELA. So after students read and answer the part A and part B of the questions. Well, this was the part A. I didn't get past the part A. Um, it's called a story called I to B. And um, I'm assuming that the children read the whole story. That's what I would encourage them to do, is read the story. I'll try to wrap that up quickly. Um, so the part A says, Read the sentence from paragraph one. Rufus sat beside me for a while, hoping I'd be up to something more than misery. What does the word misery mean as it is used in the sentence? A, confusion. B, exhaustion. C, nervousness. D, unhappiness. I was confused by this because I went back and looked at what, what did happen in the beginning. This is a story about a young girl who goes to apologize. She makes an apology. So I thought, well, actually, maybe she's nervous. I know misery means like really unhappy, but that didn't seem to fit. Then I went and thought, maybe if I went to part B, it would give me a clue about what the answer to part A was. So the answer to the, the selections in part B are which detail from the story best provides the best clue for the meaning of the word misery. Waiting for nothing with nothing I wanted to do. Tired of waiting and went off on his own. See, and right away I knew what I had to do. And D, no plans. I'm still a little stumped by what the right answer is for this. Um, but I do know that if I were coaching my students, I would want them to read deeply into the text and come up with an answer that actually isn't there. I will stop there. I do hope as someone asked you to actually try taking this test, um, set aside a good chunk of time. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm Okay, so I'm going to call Phoenix and then three because I think we've caught up. Yes, no, three call. No. Okay. Gary Cordillo from Wayne, Joel Patterson, Meg Maloney, and Ross Levin and Karen Ingalls, and Marie Nooner, I think, or none. Joel's is left and I'm Meg Maloney left. Sorry? Joel's. Okay, then come on down next. I'm passing. And you are? Oh, you're passing. Okay, so how about Jerry? Ross Levin and Karen Ingalls? Rose Levin, I'm sorry. Rose Levin and Karen Ingalls? I'm Marie. Marie, come on down. How about Kirk Souza? Come on down. You can come down. Carolyn Corcoran and Katie Grassa? Okay. 
good evening, uh, thank you to the board. My name is Marie Miner, and I'm a teacher at Boston International High School, a high school that serves a 100% immigrant student body from over 40 countries around the world, most of whom are above average high school age for their grade. I teach English language arts, ESL, and special education to 11th graders. We are set to administer our end of year assessments tomorrow and Wednesday. Before the administration of the PDA in March, my colleague and I sat down to take the 11th grade practice test available online. When we finished, we shared our answer choices, and we quickly found ourselves in debate about nearly <coughs> half of all questions. We strongly felt that each of our answer choices was the correct one, and we were both able to support our interpretation of evidence. Each of us was able to sway the other from our choices after discussion, leaving us with no clear, correct answer. We had the answer key in front of us, but there was no rationale or accompanying <coughs> reasoning to why, our, why a particular answer <coughs> choice was the correct one. We reached out to BPS to see if they had any rationale available. They explained that they did not, and that they had been asking hard for the reasoning for some time, but to no avail. In addition to the lack of reasoning behind the nuanced interpretations we were encountering, the level of text was often well above the 11th grade lifestyle band, which is 1100 to 1300, and well above our students' independent ability level. Basically, we do not believe the quality or fairness of the park assessment for the majority of students, especially not for our English language learners who are older and new to the country, or our students with disabilities. As teachers, we know that our students are being penalized for what we consider strong inferential thinking and quality interpretation using textual evidence. If PARC were to move forward, the assessment itself would need to be substantially revised in order to be fair or informative. As teachers who do not teach to the test, we do not view PARC as a catalyst for us to engage our students in 21st century skills or critical thinking in our classrooms. That is our work and we do that work every day, despite a lack of resources in our schools. We strongly believe that our motivated and committed students, though they need more time and support than most, will be college and career ready without this high space uh, assessment. Thank you for your time. Good evening. My name is Rose Levine, and this is my colleague, Karen Engel. We teach third, fourth, and fifth grade in Cambridge. And thank you for inviting us to be part of this statewide conversation about assessment. We have a number of concerns about over testing, and our colleague, um, Kathy Curley, has brought to the petitions that we've been circulating in the last several weeks, um, and her most concerned by many educators and parents in Cambridge. So, why are we concerned about the parks? We believe, um, and again, echoing the concerns of educators, such as my colleague here, that the park does not truly assess higher order thinking skills. We know that reading passages are not normed to grade level expectations, so students may have difficulty comprehending the selected passages, even if they have sophisticated critical thinking skills. The technology infrastructure that will be required for these assessments, and that has been required for those schools piloting the assessments, necessitates countless dollars that could be better spent in classrooms. These tests are timed in contrast to the MCAS, and I don't think we can underestimate the impact of that that has on students' ability to perform. There's significant test creep with this test, meaning a much longer testing season and more days um, undergoing the standardized test. The keyboarding that's required for children beginning in grade three ends up assessing typing skills rather than thinking skills. And lastly, the park does not provide significantly more timely feedback than the current MCAS. Right now, our assessment culture at the local, state, and national level is one of relentless testing, testing, and more testing. Our current policies punish teachers and schools. We are deeply concerned about the increasing stress and anxiety we observe in our students. We believe that all children are capable of high-level critical thinking and problem solving, and we absolutely concur with that as a goal. A holistic approach to assessing these skills should involve multiple ways for teachers to monitor student progress. This is what we do every day. We observe students puzzle through a math problem. We listen to them read. We discuss ideas with them. We respond to their daily work carefully. We don't learn much from these tests. We know this information. 
from being expert practitioners. We are the experts on our students. We want a holistic assessment system that will allow students to demonstrate their learning in deep interdisciplinary ways. At our school, students do that by writing and performing in historical fiction plays, by writing persuasive letters to local officials, by offering design blueprints as our schools moved from K-8 to K-5 and 6-8. We heard tonight about the value of digital literacy, and we value digital literacy, especially for those who lack that access at home. But we believe that those technological skills must be taught in a meaningful, contextualized, social setting. Technology can be a tool for problem solving, but preparing students to take the part online will not achieve this digital literacy goal. We want our students to love learning, to be inspired, to deepen their sense of curiosity and wonder. We want them to embrace a passion for social justice so that they can make our world a better place. We want them to develop a growth mindset so that they can approach their development as learners with perseverance and optimism. We want them to find their own special ways to shine, both within the traditional academic disciplines and beyond them. The park assessment will not help us achieve these hopes and dreams for our children in Massachusetts. Please vote against implementing this assessment system. I am not against a standardized test. I am against rethinking how they are given. 
I don't think that we need five days of ELA to let you all, to let everyone know whether or not our children are reading at grade level, or that they can write at grade level, or that they can perform mathematically at grade level. I think we need to reduce the amount of testing that our students are asked to take daily. In terms of MCAS, oh, I'll stop there. So my thought about MCAS is my biggest issue when going back to MCAS is that there are many, when you take the MCAS, only the stories and the questions that everyone has counts. We spend so much time in our students reading these stories on day one that, that don't actually count towards, towards their tests. So we're exhausting our students on day one knowing that all the questions typically count on day three. And so I really want to, I think we need to rethink testing as a whole and I also want to think about how to incorporate technology into that. As a new principal last year, I had one laptop card for 893 students. I spent my budget getting seven Chromebook cards, but it's going to cost me my budget for the next three years. We now have eight cards for 893 children. Both options were unacceptable. Um, and so how we will fund to make sure this happens, but I do believe in it, and I would love to be part of a conversation in supporting it. Thank you. Can I ask you to elaborate on something? Because we've spent some time um, hearing about surveys uh, and uh, quite a bit. The department's done a lot of that. Teachers and principals across the state how much time they spend on testing across mm -hmm. the board. And you referred to a lot of days, but you mentioned a lot of those are not all day tests. Is that correct? So I know it sprinkles through the year, but how much do you, you think of it as time? And how much of it? time devoted increase or not increase? So in urban areas, when you have a large population of ELLs and special ed students, for many of those students, it, it is a vast majority of the day. You have on time assessment. Um, so I also so for example, not park, right? Well, well there are yes, special yes. ed students in park right. who have on time testing. Um, you know, we had students working for for long hours throughout the day. Um, some English language learners also qualify right. for on time, and in a school with a large population of both. It, it impacts the school on a longer day because we just we have to shut down the schedule. We have 29 small group accommodations at high school. And so you have to shut down for a huge chunk of the morning. So though, even though the vast majority of kids were done within the 60 minutes today, um, there was still a huge subset of kids that were not. And so it's hard to keep the schedule moving in that way. Thank you for Good evening. Thanks for your time tonight. My name is Kirk Souza. I uh, sit here as a concerned parent uh, against uh, Colin Core and Park. Uh, since 93, we've had a great run in the states, um, setting the pace for educational excellence. And um, for me, there is no magic bullet to that success. Uh, that success is a perfect storm of our then frameworks, uh, the MCAS testing, uh, the, the teachers, the schools, and of course the parents. Um, although I don't believe that there is a magic bullet to success. I do believe there is a poison pill, and that poison pill is federal encroachment on education. Um, I've heard people say this is not federal education, this is not national education. Let's be clear about this. This, this is textbook nationalized education. Um, so, so he who pays the piper calls the tune. And so because we are beholden to federal dollars, such as our share of the $4.3 billion race to the top fund, we are obligated to play along with the federal strings attached. And these federal strings attached to race to the top are not just adopted in Common Core and Park, but they're also the, the data collection program, as well as, most importantly, the loss of local control of education. If race to the top is the carrot, then no child left behind is the stick. Uh, NCLB, which is still a, a, the law on, on the books, um, if states do not willingly go along with race to the top, they can be punished by the hard provisions in NCLB, such as not getting a waiver and hence the loss of funding. So yes, Common Core and Park are part of a nationalized education um, um, program. So with, with this backdrop, um, public ed education will be supplanted by corporate interest. We will be stuck with deteriorating in one size fits all quality, uh, intrusive collection of data, and an inability to make changes as we all see fit in Massachusetts. Uh, this has already manifested itself in Pearson and the Gates Foundation. 
Uh, teachers are not allowed to, to discuss tests, and they are also signing non disclosure agreements. Uh, this, this is not for me. Uh, so, so please help us. Uh, this, is, this is not us against you. Uh, we're asking you to, to rejoin us. Um, let's not up for that poison pill, and let's get out of common core and work together and blaze another new path in our tradition of excellence in Massachusetts. Yeah. Thank you. Of course, was the thing that made our great public 
university targets that are successful across professional fields, this is something perhaps we should look at in terms of assessing curriculum to introduce into the high schools to encourage independent thought in the questioning process that is so important to advance learning and education. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Tom Busnell, President of the American Federation of Teachers in Massachusetts. Secretary Pfizer, Chair Sagan, other members of the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education, and Commissioner Chester. It is a bit to be here. The advantage of going late is practically everything that's been said I was going to say. So I will get right to the point very quickly. Now we do have issues with high stakes testing, but I want to talk only about park technology. That is a serious issue. Approximately 15 to 20 percent of the students in this state come out of poverty. I can assure you that the variation in technological sophistication from community to community is enormous. If every school is going to have technology at the highest level, the financial investment has to be absolutely enormous. And what I'm hearing about available resources right now is extremely disturbing. The volume of testing. You've heard people who are right on the ground talking about the volume of testing. It is absolutely extraordinary, the volume of testing. And from what I'm hearing is that PARC is going to require an even greater volume of testing. This goes right to the heart of education. Are we taking away from the education of these kids, particularly those coming out of poverty, because of all the testing that we're doing? Another item. Massachusetts students are the highest achieving in the nation. They're the highest achieving in the Western world in the international science and math tests. Now, if we are so successful, why do we want to go to this test that is nationally set? Are we going to have the same influence in determining standards, etc.? Because of the involvement of so many other places that do not have the high standards that we have. I think that is extremely important. I would also suggest that classroom teachers actually have access to these questions. They are the men and the women that are dealing with the boys and girls every single day. They can give tremendous feedback. I think that is an enormous disadvantage of this park test. And lastly, my understanding is, is that other states have had major problems with park. I do not have the specifics here, but that information I have been given and so all these things put together, my recommendation is no go on park. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to you in regards to the park assessment that thus far only test takers are allowed to see. No one else has any idea other than the practice test. Can you just me? Oh, I'm sorry. That was my next one. Okay. Maybe <laughs> you'd be like three lines. Settle down, Mr. Sagan. <laughs> How much time do you need? <laughs> well, actually, I wrote this like this five different times. First time was ten minutes. I'm down to, like, think about three and a half. Okay. Please don't be tired this yet. Okay. <laughs> My name is Mary Antoine, and I retired from Old Public Schools after teaching at the elementary level for 35 years. I am presently the Executive Vice President of the United Teachers of Lowell and a Vice President on the Executive Board of AFT Massachusetts. Of utmost importance, I am also the grandmother of four grandchildren currently enrolled in Lowell Public Schools. I have lived through and taught through numerous position papers, legislative acts, bills, and initiatives during the past 40 plus years. The latest two are known as the No Child Left Behind Act, or NCLB of 2001, and in 2010, the Race to the Top Initiative, which became NCLB on steroids. These and more, sadly, have come to define public education in America as failing 
causing us to become the most tech-obsessed nation in the world. I believe the biggest jolt came to me with the adoption of NCLB. One of its provisions was that all students would be proficient in reading and math and be on grade level by the end of grade three. That's when I realized that we have leaders in our nation who are making very bad policy and educational decisions, and our students and schools would continue to suffer at the hands of non-educators. As of today, every state in the nation is considered a failure in accordance with NCLB, and all are currently breaking the law, with the exception of those on waiver by Secretary of Education, Ani Duncan. Without a doubt, NCLB has been our greatest failure in public education. Massachusetts is the birthplace of public education. The entire na nation watched in awe as the Mass DOE, not the educated students and parents, proclaimed back in 2010 that we would adopt new educational standards, sight unseen, despite being distinguished as having the highest performing students in the nation. What sense did it make for us to race to the top when we were already there? But a job that we did on our second application and horrendous changes in the composition of classrooms and curriculum have occurred since. Our curriculum has been narrowed down to two subjects, math and ELA, intervention and remediation groups rule our schools. Our urban districts are being decimated as evidenced by the recent state takeover of Holyoke Public Schools, despite gains being made by all stakeholders in that community. I applaud the three board members who voted against the takeover of Holyoke schools. To those groups who proclaim the common core and heart to prepare our students for college and career, I ask where have that been proven? Where's the evidence that these proposed tests are reliable and valid? And without that evidence, how are we allowing them to be used to fail so many students? New York State is about three years ahead of us on all this, and their first year of testing against the common core revealed that about 70% of the state's students failed. The second year, about 68% failed, and that was based on lowering the cut score. 30,000 families opted out of New York State tests in the second year, and this year, more than 190,000 families opted out. Please pay attention to the trends of the nation. It is the parents and educators who oppose these non-educator grades K-12 created standards and assessments. We have no money behind us, yet our base grows stronger and larger every day, all across the nation. For our educational leaders to endorse an, an assessment that fails so many is unconscionable. Please show the students, teachers, and families of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. My allergies are making my mouth dry. That you can use, that you as board members can use a bit of your own critical thinking skills by voting to oppose the park assessments for the state of Massachusetts. Both Bill Gates and David Coleman, who was a, a, an original creator of the Common Core, and Bill being the financier, have said that it could be about 10 years before we know if this experiment has worked. My grandchildren do not have 10 years, and I come here tonight to ask you to place a vote in favor of my grandchildren. Thank you. inspired me. 
teachers who gave you books to read, like Albert Camus' The Rebel, that taught you to think a little bit differently, or books like Down These Mean Streets by Perry Thomas, that taught me that there were different worlds in this country, and that social justice was something that we all should be striving for. Believe it or not, science education has always, at its best, integrated technology into the classroom. Over the years, I have introduced students to biotechnology using gel electrophoresis for DNA testing, the technology of engineering using reels, pulleys, and levers, and the technology of chemistry, Bunsen burners, speakers, and test tubes. But today, technology only means computers. And by and large, those computers, if available, are there for testing. As standardized testing has been used to label students and schools, the budgets for the technology of science has, has been usurped for the technology of testing. Discussions in our departments have changed. When I, when I came, became a teacher, I came in as, a, as an innovator, and we had discussions like, how do I turn my students on to learning? And that has changed in, the, in, our, uh, in our department meetings to how do we get them to pass the test? I think if you look at those two questions, it tells a lot about where we are as a society in public education. Um, now our meetings are even more centered on these tests. Uh, how do we improve open response questions? rather than how do I develop lessons that might actually inspire and engage my students. With the implementation of PARC, these discussions will now change again. This time, we'll have, we'll, we, uh, the discussion will, will be about how do I get my students to read science better, because there are no science tests. And as a result, the technology of science is going to be is going to be even more uh, further relegated to irrelevancy because that won't be on the test. So while you sit here trying to figure out how to get the technology for testing, you better be honest and say budgets for the supplies of science will continue to get cut. And these funds transferred to buy computer technology and even more transferred into the pockets of the testing industry. Yeah.
Once the public schools in impoverished urban America were completely depleted of the necessary resources to succeed and could not possibly measure up to their more affluent counterparts on high stakes tests, it was only a matter of time before they would inevitably be declared failures through the new systems of testing, be taken over by the state, and handed over to a wide variety of private education entrepreneurs. These private management companies and charter operators could then make a handsome profit off of taxpayer dollars and other fraudulent real estate schemes. All of this would be done in the name of the new civil rights issue of our time and a parade of new front organizations would be created with token black staff, many extremely well intended, to legitimize this racist corporate assault and takeover of urban public education. In this process of corporate takeovers, entire school communities have been destroyed and torn asunder. Deeply committed educators fired, students and families thrown to the winds, students with the greatest hardships pushed out while those who stood a chance of being pummeled into testing shape were kept. Um, let me skip on. The real question is not which test shall we use, but in what direction are we headed as a society? Do we want to allow the corporate few to dictate policy, exploit impoverished urban communities, and use tests to legitimize and justify inequality? Or do we want to reclaim our schools for the good of the whole? It is time to disrupt business as usual. We can no longer conform to policies that are destroying our communities, our youth, our hope. Let us support the new legislative initiatives to halt the punitive consequences of high stakes testing. Let's re envision what quality education means to us. And let's reclaim our power to co create democratically run public schools that reflect our values of social justice, holistic individual and community growth. Let us renew our common humanity. Hi, my name is Betsy Pavall and I'm a seventh grade ELA teacher in Cambridge. Are we more concerned with the future of testing or the future of the students we serve? I have been told that the park is helping prepare our students for 21st century jobs. Aside from filling out online surveys, how often do we as adults click A, B, C, or D? Secondly, what kind of jobs are we preparing our students for? Yes, technology is crucial to today's world. However, if technology is going to be incorporated, it must be authentic. In Cambridge, students have access to Google Drive and Google Docs, Lucid Press and VoiceThread, real-world programs that in an engaging way allow students to show what they know. I have had the experience of piloting a tablet-based curriculum. Students were happy to return back to paper and pencil. The glitches in the programming and crashing of the operating systems contributed to high anxiety and frustration. Although I was provided for two months with two technology specialists to assist with these issues, on average two to three times per school day, student work was lost. Often the unreliable wireless network would crash, rendering the tablets useless. Students would use class time to work on paper and waste time later on transferring their work to the online program. Districts should not be forced to hire technology specialists to assist with administering standardized tests. Any additional funds should be used to putting more teachers in the classroom. Let's not confuse the technology that, that students will use on the part to technology they are exposed to in their everyday lives. Technology does not coincide with critical thinking. In, my, in fact, it can lead to the opposite. If you were to ask any one of my students to perform a task online, their first question would be, is there an app for that? Heavy exposure to texting and video games does not translate into writing a well-developed composition, and as a seventh grade ELA teacher, I can attest to this. For the sample seventh grade ELA park exam, students are to read a passage from the Count of Monte Cristo and it's seen from Blessings. The prompt instructs students to, quote, write an essay in which you identify a theme from each text and analyze how each theme is developed. This language is subjective and vague. Are students to analyze the same singular common theme, similar themes, or two unrelated themes? Multiple choice questions often include phrasing such as most likely and mainly suggest, which lends itself to debate. 
Multiple choice questions on the test are presented in two parts, meaning if one of the two parts is incorrect, the entire question is marked wrong. After reading a short story, students are asked to, quote, write an original story that describes what Kevin does next to try to change Howie's mind about playing for Cromwell's training with only a generic rubric provided to guide their work. This test will, I'm almost done. This test will not create equity. It will not put districts on an even playing field. I have not heard any testimony to support that the result from PARC will be used to support students within the current school year. Since the results can and will impact student placement in the following year, this is tracking. Well-funded districts and families with the resources to provide additional tutoring for students will be in a more advantageous position, creating further disparity between the haves and the have-nots. The PARC will not close the gap, it will divide us. Thank you. I wanted to bring it back to something that the 
the governor said, um, we need a public discussion on this. I think it's an embarrassment that a state has spent two years giving educators, families, parents, administrators, and others an opportunity to comment and engage around the assessment system that eventually became unpassed based on you know, a voice or an opportunity to engage in the discussion at all before we went ahead and executed on Common Core and Park. So what I am mostly going to speak about is Common Core. Um, I think there's a taboo amongst parents with talking about our children's academic difficulties. I feel it's important for you to hear this side of what we see in the trenches. By the way, I also practice my name is Kirsten, Ale uh, Kirsten Obiachi, and I am from Melrose. Um, and I, before you hear this, I also want to say that I believe that their father and I is what you would consider an American success story, I guess. Um, their dad grew up in LA and at the age of eight would take 45 minutes worth of public transportation to get to his school. He is a subspecialist physician making a very healthy salary right now. Um, and he, he got two master's degrees um, after he did not get accepted in medical school three years in a row. And he's doing very well. I am a retired professional athlete who became number one in division one sports. Um, and retired to have my family. So before you hear about all the faults that I'm about to mention, um, keep that in mind that we know what grit is, perseverance, failure, struggles. We know it all. I do not think that my children are geniuses and they should never fall down. I believe in that entire process. Um, in September third grade, my son began to frequently struggle with homework. Homework is always a night in math sheet and some spelling words to memorize for the week. For the most part, aside from projects, this was the only work that I saw as a parent. Most work was done and kept in class. These struggles with math homework escalated to mental temper tantrums that could last up to three hours to get through and to get math homework done. It frequently had he and I in tears. This was not my son. This kid never even had a tantrum during the terrible twos. He was a pensive and mature kid. His nickname was Smiley Eyes because he would get up the room. Now nightly, he would call himself stupid over and over again. He sometimes would form a fist, bang the table, and once even hit his own head while calling himself stupid. I began a half angry to figure out why this was happening, what changed, why did my kid think he was stupid, he previously loved math. I started to pay attention to the homework sheets, I sat with him, I talked with him, I asked him questions, I asked to see his textbook. I started to see there was no classical equation work in math. I realized there was no mastery-driven instruction. It was all analyzing and breaking down of numbers. There were no teachings towards automaticity. It was pictures, diagrams, and arrays, and right to explain. The topic lessons and the written problems and questions all were poorly written. And because of this, I myself struggled to understand what was being taught and then asked for it in problems. And I received a degree in sciences from our country's number one public university of Cal. I knew with the opinion, uh, I knew with the curriculum was trying to explain, I understood its purpose, but it was done very poorly, and my son, and I believe all children, in my opinion, and not of experts, are not primed to be able to conceptualize this at these ages. Certainly not very successfully with no mastery and authenticity built in or laid firmly down with a foundation. I asked my son if he understood these lessons the teacher was teaching, and he said no. How can multiplication and division be so complicated and hard for a smart, receptive kid? A kid who had always been doing well, no hiccups, no conferences with teachers who needed improvement. A kid who had never been on an IP and we would later find out was an advanced math and class tester. A kid who now is two grades beyond grade level in classical math and English. Knowing three times four is twelve should be the goal for an eight-year-old. He is failing in the system of very limited foundational classical work and entirely conceptual math and writing to explain. Just about every single problem on every single test my son has taken since installment of Common Core and Math has been in word poem format. The multiplication chapter test he took in third grade, only after 13 days total spent on multiplication, was 15 word problems with multiple parts to answer. Not one classical equation of three times four is 12. My inquiry obviously led me to find out about Common Core. I read and printed out everything I could. I figured it out. First and foremost, it was Common Core and all the entails that was destroying my son. Second, it was the educators, administrators, government that did not use common sense and fight against it that was destroying my son. Nor did they fight for what they know to be true <clears throat> about development and education 
nor use what they know for research, education experts, and psychology. Third, it was Pearson that was destroying my side with their narrow-minded interpretation, severely limited teachings, and poorly written everything. We went through months of tantrums at home and his low self-confidence and self-worth and negative thoughts and self-talk. No child should think he was stupid and pass such tantrums at age eight over school schoolwork. No child. So I started to homeschool my children an hour to an hour and a half every afternoon after an already full six-hour school day. We started with sheets, classical equations, road work mixed with fun math. Right from the start of tutoring him after school until the present time, I see his successes at home that make him feel proud, smart, and successful. Yet then and still now, he gets red marks on schoolwork that rightly frustrates him. His academic life is a game of tug of war between a negative school learning experience of red marks and frustrations and a positive classical homeschooling environment laying foundations of non-existent and common core curriculum. I can do this because teachers are not allowed under the common core parameters. A child needs some success to want to move onward. Common core math in particular is not giving that success so desperately needed for a child to want to persevere, and I know about perseverance. I traveled the world in my craft. I know what perseverance means. Its sole purpose and focus is on problem solving and explaining. 21st century skills, as people call it. Shouldn't solving three times four equals 12 be the goal of these young ages, and shouldn't that be celebrated? With the common core driven standards, that is not enough, and that is at the core of what is failing our children. The common core standards treat him like a nail, it hammers down on him every single day with his failures in class from requirements in school that are developmentally inappropriate for his age, according to Erickson, Bruner, Piaget, and others. I did get my degree in psychology, I do know what I am talking about. I believe the experts in the fields in psychology and education and what I see with my own eyes and gets proven daily from the trenches. I am giving my son positive research based learning at home to combat the hammering down and negative field education he receives in school. He is smart, full of potential, and I will make sure he believes it. That's why we are not taking the park exam. I don't need a park test testing common core to tell me anything about my son. He succeeds in learning the exact same topics at home, but in a classical way, in both approaches, in math, and with the exact same correct numerical answer. My son also validates the purpose of these standardized testing because I take away every single afternoon to homeschool him. The school will not get my child's test score because he loses this part of his childhood. If he scores well, why should they get his score? Regardless of the reasons, I would never subject him to an unproven test with heavily, heavy accountability based on an unproven, untested curriculum based on developmentally inappropriate standards. The park exam is poorly written and tricky. I know, I took the test myself. I am an educated human being, not a white suburban mom who would be upset if Common Core shares my kid is not brilliant to quote Mr. Duncan. I am an educated mom who absolutely can teach my kids the Common Core way. I choose not to at their age. If you tested him on multiplication, division, fractions, and classical division format, he would prove his knowledge and skills in answering all answers to perfection or almost to perfection, which isn't that the goal for an eight-year-old. He can explain later, at 14 plus years old, how he did it and write to explain what cognitive development says is appropriate for him to do in one last thing. Robert Frost said education is the ability to listen to almost anything without losing your temper or your self-confidence. This is absolutely not the case of common core standards education and all it entails, as I see with my son. There is only frustration and failures hammering down self-confidence, preventing their ability to listen and causing young children's tempers to flare all while affecting their future, and that is the greatest sin of this whole debacle. I so apologize for that being so long. Hello, my name is Shannon Dostrom. I'm a mother of two young children, a full-time CPA, and a resident of Chelmsford, Mass. Uh, you don't know this, but we have had many conversations together. Um, usually, I'm in my car and I'm commuting to and from work. And sometimes I'm just doing things around the house, but our conversations are usually very one sided as I'm the one talking. But, you know, Mr. Commissioner, I've, I've asked you things in our conversations, such as where is the support for pushing such young children, including my six year old daughter, to achieve basic algebra and math? 9 equals x minus 5 is algebra if you are solving for x. And asked to explain how any system can ensure every child is college and career ready 
when there are so many possibilities making people college and career ready? I ask, why do you rely more on non-experts, such as David Coleman, Jason Zimba, and Susan Pimentel, and on our own mass experts, such as Sandra Stotsky, or early childhood experts like defending the early years? Mr. Secretary, I don't want you to feel left out. We, too, have had a few conversations, usually around refusing the test. I've asked why so many parents have complained that schools have denied them the ability to refuse the test for their child. I ask why, why test refusals could not be considered an excellent point of data and information on assessing the test. If parents refuse it, I think that's a very strong message. And of course, Mr. Chairman, although you are new to the board, I'm uh, asked to explain how we can be sure Park will be assessing anything well when many of us have not seen very much of the test. I've taken the sample test on Park's website, but I really wonder what I have not seen. Has everyone on the board taken all of the sample tests? But more importantly, I ask how can we believe that one test will assess readiness? Readiness for colleges, for college and careers that have infinite possible outcomes for all of these children. How is that possible? MCAS was not created to, accept, to assess all of their readiness because it's not possible. No, there, there are other goals for public education. I'm trying to make light of something, some very serious questions I have, and I know they cannot be adequately answer, answered in just a few minutes of your time. I also know I cannot adequate, adequately explain to you in only three minutes or three hours all of the reasons I oppose the use of Common Core, Park, high stakes testing, data collection, computerized testing in early grades, and time teacher evaluations to test the growth scores. And of course, after listening to everything tonight, I assume we will be having a very lively conversation on my drive home. See you. Thank you for your time.
If we say yes to BARC, we're going to be sending huge amounts of our commonwealth out of state, out of country. Don't get me wrong, I think profit has its place and has a, it, it, it can be good, but I think it should be stay closer to home where we reinvested in our communities. I'm almost done. So I'm really asking you, please listen to, to us. Please reject PARC number one. And then please say no to high stakes testing for the sake of our children and our families and our democracy. Thank you. And I'm here to talk principally about three things. Um, about high stakes testing itself, questions about that, uh, about the locus of control, and about the time frame for making this decision. As I've been sitting back there in the audience listening to everybody, I feel like what this art discussion is not is really about the discussion about digital versus paper and pencil. We can do either of those things with NCAST or PARC. I think it's also not about pro common core or anti common core. I don't think it's about college and career ready or not college and career ready. I really think, it, or, or an assessment aligned to the common core or not aligned to the common core. To me, it really comes down to control over uh, the testing program that we choose to utilize in Massachusetts and the time frame for making this kind of decision. So just really quickly, because I know others have touched on this, but questions about high state testing itself. I think that we as a state need to revisit and define the purpose for all the testing that we're doing right now. I, I would like us to see um, that we can be panels of teachers, school committee members, superintendents, lawmakers, state department officials, unions and parents to revisit the purpose of standardized testing, high stakes testing, and decide what program of assessments, how much, what farm, how often, with what metrics, best serve the needs and goals that are identified through this review process. I think we need to quantify the amount of time teachers spend prepping students for testing and actually taking tests. And we need to really take a close look at the impact on the school day, the disruption to learning, and the students themselves. The second point, and I feel like this is really a critical one for me, is the locus of control. I feel strongly that by going to park, we will move the locus of control further away from educators, from teachers, school committee members, administrators, state department officials, as well as parents in Massachusetts. Our ability to ask and answer the questions that I stated above will be greatly diminished. We will find ourselves in the position of fighting against a national consortium rather than our own Department of Education around such topics as how much testing, what kind of testing, what kind of scoring calibration is most appropriate. Um, finally, the third issue gets down to the time frame. I really question what the rush towards this decision is. We have an assessment system that's fully aligned to the Common Core, that's the MCAS. Um, so uh, I'm wondering what we'll be losing by waiting, studying, and having more conversations about this. I feel like the rush to park fits in with a move, a move towards testing students on the computer. Many students in my own district and in many other districts don't have the access to appropriate technology on a regular basis. This would introduce an additional bias in, into the testing system. And it is a little curious to me that there's a great appetite and interest in using technology for testing when I don't feel like that same appetite has been there to purchase technology for teaching and learning. So I'll just wrap up by saying that I really think that we, have an we haven't answered the questions above yet about for what purpose, what's the best way to accomplish this purpose, and how much is the right amount. So I would encourage us to hold off on making a decision on the form type and amount until we reach consensus on the form type and amount of standardized testing we choose to undertake in Massachusetts. And I thank you a lot for staying this late. And if we stayed late too, you're giving up your evening. So I just want to thank you for, for your time. Thank you.